Hi, and welcome to episode 79 of Talk Signals TV, where we bring you the biggest in cannabis and hemp news stories every week. I'm Steve Elliott, the editor at TalkSignals.com, and I'll be guiding you through the news. It's good to be back after a couple of weeks hiatus. Let's look at our bud pick of the week. We have some sledgehammer haze. This young lady is just about ready to go into flower, as you see pictured here. Her genetics are from Secret Seeds in Seattle. Let's do the news now, shall we? In the United States this week, we had a smackdown. A couple of congressmen told the Department of Justice to halt their medical marijuana prosecutions. In a letter to U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder, released Wednesday afternoon, United States Representative Sam Farr, Democrat of California, and Dana Rohrabacher, Republican of California, refuted the Justice Department's recent interpretation of a spending provision intended to protect state medical marijuana laws, and they confirmed that any criminal or civil action against medical marijuana providers is a violation of federal law. This letter came in response to statements made last week by a Justice Department spokesman to the Los Angeles Times. In that article, the spokesman said the DOJ can still prosecute medical marijuana cases, notwithstanding the spending restrictions adopted by Congress. In the letter, the congressman tell the Justice Department's, call the Justice Department's interpretation emphatically wrong, and they ask Attorney General Holder to bring the department back into compliance with federal law by halting prosecutions and asset forfeiture actions in states with medical marijuana laws. Any questions federal prosecutors might have had about the meaning of the amendment are answered in this letter from the amendment's authors, said Dan Riffle, Director of Federal Policies for the Marijuana Policy Project. Throughout their debate on the measure, congressional members made it abundantly clear that it prevents the Justice Department from bringing or continuing criminal and civil actions against medical marijuana providers. Even those who spoke against the amendment said as much. It's U.S. attorneys like Melinda Haig in the Bay Area who are breaking federal law, not the dispensaries they're prosecuting, Riffle said. These federal prosecutors have gone rogue, and the attorney general needs to rein them in. Their campaign against medical marijuana is no longer just misguided. It's also illegal. Also in the United States this week, more big things moving on the ground. We have Representative Blumenauer and Senator Wyden, both of Oregon, announcing tax reform for legal marijuana businesses, a much needed change for a long time now. Representative Earl Blumenauer and Senator Ron Wyden, both Democrats from Oregon, on Thursday announced their plans to introduce bicameral legislation next week that would reconcile state marijuana laws and federal tax law. The Small Business Tax Equity Act, which was introduced last Congress by Congressman Blumenauer, would create an exception to Internal Revenue Code Section 280E to allow marijuana businesses operating in compliance with state laws to take deductions associated with the sale of marijuana, like any other legal business. More than two-thirds of Americans now live in jurisdictions that have legalized either the medical or adult use of marijuana, said Congressman Blumenauer. It's time for the federal government to catch up. Section 280E creates an unequal and unrealistic tax burden on these businesses, Blumenauer said. He said he was excited to work with Senator Wyden in introducing the Small Business Tax Equity Act, which would bring much needed fairness and level the playing field for small businesses that follow state laws and create jobs. Our legislation would provide an overdue update to federal tax law, which is not caught up to the fact that it's 2015 and Oregonians have voted both to legalize medical marijuana and to regulate marijuana for recreational use, Senator Wyden said. This is a question of standing up for the people of Oregon and ensuring that the federal government respects the decision Oregonians have made at the ballot box. 23 states, the District of Columbia, and Guam have passed laws allowing for the legal use of medical marijuana. An additional 12 states have passed laws allowing the use of low THC forms of marijuana to treat certain medical conditions, the so-called CBD-only laws. In many of these jurisdictions, patients can access medicine safely through state-regulated dispensaries. The federal tax code, however, prohibits anyone selling Schedule I or Schedule II substances 
from deducting business expenses associated with the sale of marijuana from their taxes. Marijuana, of course, being, illogically, a Schedule One substance. Therefore, even businesses operating in compliance with state law are not allowed to deduct the common expenses of running a small business, such as rent, most utilities, and payroll. They can't claim the work opportunity tax credit if they hire a veteran, and they're limited in lawful deductions relating to construction or operation costs if they want to remodel a building for their retail operations. In certain circumstances, legal marijuana businesses can pay federal income tax rates at nearly 90 percent, while the U.S. Small Business Administration estimates that many small businesses pay an effective tax rate of around 20 percent. Congress never intended to impose a gross receipts tax, and that's pretty much what we have here, on legal business owners decades in the future, said Grover Norquist, president of Americans for Tax Reform. The intent of the law was to go after criminals, not law-abiding job creators. Congress needs to step up and clarify that this provision has become a case study in unintended consequences. The small businesses that make up the legal cannabis industry are working overtime to be responsible, contributing members of their communities, said Aaron Smith, executive director of the National Cannabis Industry Association. So it's particularly outrageous that when they try to do the right thing by paying their federal taxes, they end up penalized with double and triple tax rates. Instead of being able to create more jobs, increase salaries, or add benefits for their employees, these businesses are being forced to send more than two-thirds of their profits straight to the federal government, Smith said. Representative Blumenauer and Senator Widener are standing up for fairness and support for small business, something everyone should applaud. We certainly do. And another story from the United States, it came to light this week that Drug Enforcement Administration agents consorted with prostitutes provided by drug traffickers. If you're an American citizen, you must be aware that the federal DEA and their agents spend plenty of your tax money in Latin America. Recent revelations that DEA agents attended sex parties hosted by the same drug traffickers they were supposed to be fighting shed some revealing light on what they've been up to. According to a report from the Department of Justice, several DEA agents, some with top security clearances, mind you, allegedly participated in multiple sex orgies with prostitutes funded by the local drug cartels. Some of the federal agents also got cash, gifts, and weapons from the traffickers. Incredibly, the sex parties occurred at the agents' government leased quarters where laptops and other equipment were easily accessible, raising the possibility that DEA equipment and information also may have been compromised as a result of the agent's conduct, according to this DOJ report. Less widely reported was a much more serious allegation that U.S. soldiers and military contractors raped at least 54 women and girls between 2004 and 2007 while deployed as part of Plan Colombia, the nearly $10 billion U.S. drug war quote-unquote, military aid package designed to prop up the deeply corrupt Colombian government. None of those involved has faced any consequences. Such misbehavior, including spying on governments, is the reason Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador have all kicked the DEA out of their countries. As Latin America increasingly moves beyond drug prohibition into the 21st century, each fresh example of drug war crimes and human rights abuses further damages America's doomed global drug policy. Meanwhile, at home, the DEA rejects science and obstructs research, promotes militarization of law enforcement, conducts no-knock raids and warrantless airline passenger searches, uses national security agency data to spy on U.S. residents and fabricate evidence, engages in dehumanizing detention practices, relies on controversial confidential informants, and helps create and maintain an obscene system of mass incarceration. The DEA is, as pointed out by Alternet, an out-of-control agency, run amok, literally in bed with organized crime, a perfect symbol for the corruption and impunity inherent in the war on drugs. In Texas this week, lawmakers held a hearing on a bill to reduce penalties for marijuana possession. The Texas House Committee on Criminal Jurisprudence held a hearing Wednesday on a bill that would reduce state penalties for possession of small amounts of marijuana. The hearing 
took place in the Texas State Capitol upon adjournment of the House. HB 507, authored by Committee Vice Chair Representative Joe Moody, a Democrat from El Paso, will be one of several marijuana-related bills considered by the committee. It is the only proposal that would remove the threat of arrest, jail time, and a criminal record for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana and replace them with a civil fine of $100. Now, under current Texas law, individuals found in possession of less than two ounces of marijuana can be arrested and given a criminal record, and they face up to six months in jail and a fine of up to $2,000. When I was a prosecutor, I saw firsthand how scarce our criminal justice resources are and how disproportionately harsh drug convictions can be on nonviolent offenders, especially young people, Representative Moody said. As a lawmaker, I have a responsibility to make sure we're spending our resources wisely and treating our people fairly. That's what HB 507 is about. Now, according to the FBI, there were 72,150 arrests or citations issued for marijuana-related offenses in Texas in 2012. 97% of those were for simple possession. That same year, nearly 90% of all burg burglaries, including home invasions, and 88% of all motor vehicle thefts went unsolved. Maybe because they were spending all those, uh, all their hours going after pot, huh? Criminal justice resources are limited and we need to apply them when they're needed the most, said retired Texas District Court Judge John Delaney. Many law enforcement professionals agree that arresting people, jailing them, and giving them a criminal record for low-level marijuana possession does more harm than good. Prior to the hearing, Texans for Responsible Marijuana Policy delivered a petition to lawmakers signed by more than 15,000 Texans who support reforming the state's marijuana laws. More than 60% of Texas voters support limiting the punishment for possession of up to an ounce of marijuana to a fine of $100 with no possibility of jail time, according to a September 2013 survey conducted by public policy polling. Studies have dispelled the myth that reducing penalties for marijuana possession will result in increased use, said Dr. William Martin, director of the Drug Policy Program at the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy at Rice University. There's no rational reason to maintain these draconian marijuana possession laws. And in Louisiana, residents' tolerant views on marijuana are not reflected by its harsh state laws. Louisiana residents have a much more relaxed and tolerant approach toward marijuana than is reflected by the harsh laws in their state, according to a statewide survey conducted by Louisiana State University this winter. The university asked about three different marijuana policies. First of all, the survey found that a majority of Louisianans oppose legal marijuana for personal use. 52% of state residents still oppose legalizing cannabis for recreational use, but the gap between those who don't want to legalize and those who support it at 45% is shrinking. In 2013, 56% said they opposed legalization and 42% said they supported it. Uh, that's a gap of 14 points. Now that gap has shrunk to just a seven point difference. Young adults aged 18 to 29 in Louisiana support legal marijuana with 68% supporting and just 32% opposed. One state lawmaker has filed legislation to put possession, distribution, and dispensing of cannabis on the Louisiana ballot on no November 8, 2016. Representative Dalton Honore, a Democrat from Baton Rouge, said voters should get to decide whether pot becomes legal. The second thing the survey found was that most Louisiana residents support medical marijuana. 60% support medicinal cannabis, but some reason... For some reason, that number has shrunk since last year when 79% said they supported it. People of almost all age groups support medicinal cannabis with only those 65 and older opposing it, according to the survey. Now, at least two lawmakers, the aforementioned Representative Honore and State Senator Fred Mills, are going to push for medical marijuana legalization during the spring session of the legislature, which starts next week. Governor Bobby Jindal has said he would support medical marijuana as long as it was tightly regulated. Now, thirdly, the survey found that most Louisiana residents don't agree with jailing people for small amounts of pot. Two-thirds, 67 percent, said they don't think people should be put behind bars for small amounts of weed as they are now under state law. LSU found that Louisiana law enforcement sends about seven and a half million dollars a year jailing people for small amounts of pot. 
The number of people who said nobody should be put in jail for small amounts of marijuana unsurprisingly went up to 79% when a pollster told them about this price tag for locking people up for weed. Lawmakers are also considering cannabis decriminalization bills this spring, which would impose fines rather than jail time for simple possession. In California this week, gubernatorial candidate Gavin Newsom supports marijuana legalization. Lieutenant Governor Newsom is preparing for a 2016 gubernatorial campaign, and if an expected ballot measure to legalize, regulate, and tax marijuana meets his criteria, he'll endorse it and effectively become the public face of the campaign, betting his political future on the op popularity of cannabis in the Golden State. Newsom, a Democrat, is the highest ranking official in California to support recreational legalization. Although legalization will almost certainly be popular with liberal and young voters, some political analysts believe his support for legalization could present a challenge. He could motivate large numbers of young people who aren't regular voters to turn out for him, said Director Dan Schnur of the University of Southern California's Jesse M. Unruh Institute of Politics. But taking a leadership role on this could make older swing voters nervous, even if they agree with him on the issue. It's a potentially risky play. Voters in California legalized medical marijuana in 1996 for state union to do so but in 2010 voted against recreational use, 53.5% to 46.5%. Since then, polling has shown that public support for legalizing pot has grown, reaching 53% in a March survey by the Public Policy Institute of California. That's a record high in that organization's surveys. Democrats, whites, and blacks, and people 18 to 34 showed the greatest support for legalization with more than 60% of all those groups in favor. Older residents were more skeptical in the state's two fastest growing ethnic voter groups, Latinos and Asians, strongly opposed it. Even Democratic politicians aren't united in their support for legalization. Both U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein and Governor Jerry Moonbeam Brown both oppose legalization. How many people can get stoned and still have a great state or a great nation, Governor Brown said. The world's pretty dangerous, very competitive. I think we need to stay alert, if not 24 hours a day, more than some of the potheads might be able to put together. So remember there what Governor Brown thinks of you fellas. Newsom, meanwhile, cast legalization in the context of criminal and social justice, pointing out that minority youths are more likely than others to be criminally penalized for cannabis. He insists he's never tried marijuana and that he hates the smell of the stuff. This is not a flippant debate about stoners and potheads, Newsom said in an interview. This is serious stuff and I don't want to be part of the status quo. I'm happy to take that risk because I think people will be benefited in a profound way if we do this right. People like me, we come and go. We're a dime a dozen. This is a principle that will transcend us. I happen to believe that marijuana is a hell of a lot more benign than heroin, Newsom said at a luncheon in Marin County last year, where he pledged to back whichever initiative makes it onto the 2016 ballot. I don't like drug abuse or drug use, he said. That said, I dislike the war on drugs more. It is a war on people of color, it is a war on poor people, and it is an outrage. Newsom chairs a commission of law enforcement, medical experts, and others that was created by the ACLU of Northern California to study the marijuana issue. That group recently released a report on how cannabis should be taxed, how to assess impairment among drivers, and how pot could be advertised and sold without increasing its use by teenagers. I want to see it done right, and that's why I'm telling all these groups I want to be supportive of a ballot initiative, but it has to be the right one, Newsom said. We have to be accountable and responsible for making sure that we address the intended and unintended consequences of any effort to legalize, tax, and regulate marijuana for adults. It's not good enough to put something on the ballot and begin after the fact to ask these questions, he said. Polls agree something needs to change. It is time we become more mature on this topic. Finally, in Missouri this week, we have a suspect telling cops, I'm not going to lie, I sell marijuana. This 27-year-old Missouri man was charged with selling marijuana after confessing during a traffic stop for having the wrong license plate, the St. Louis County Prosecuting Attorney's Office said on Friday. According to court documents, the original incident took place on July 24, 2014, when an officer smelled marijuana, suspect James Redman allegedly said, I just smoked some when I left hot shots. It's in the center console. The officer searched as instructed 
and indeed discovered a glass pipe, an e-cigarette, capsules with a dark liquid smelling like marijuana, and $1,534 in cash. When the officer asked where that money came from, Redmond, who evidently has a few things to learn when it comes to slinging trees, replied, I'm not going to lie, I sell marijuana. Redmond went on to tell the officer he had a book bag full of weed in the back seat. The officer looked through the book bag and he found two large bags and one small bag filled with cannabis, a digital scale, a bag of empty baggies, and a blue container containing marijuana with a label on the lid reading, Marijuana Grown in Colorado. Redmond was charged with possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute a felony. Before we go this week, we have a must-read story on toke signals you really should check out, especially if you're interested in the developing situation in Washington State. Killing medical marijuana. How could Olympia stoop so low? This was guest written for toke signals by Michael Buffalo Mazzetti. And in the article, he asks, why does the Washington State Legislature want to undermine medical cannabis? Senate Bill 5052 is an effort by the legislature that could doom our medical cannabis patient rights. This bill could bring harm and even death to many medical cannabis patients. Why would the lawmakers do this? Read this article and Mazzetti has three big reasons why. Hope to see you again next week. Until we do, stay lifted. See you then. <laughs>